um, the spies do like former employees to remain in contact. It's useful to have good chaps in good places. Because we always had the James Bond franchise, and we had John le Carre and all the adaptations. We had spooks in the noughties about MI5. They can go and commit crimes abroad, um, up to and including murder. Probably the world's worst spy, because everywhere he goes, he's expected. Annie, how are you, my friend? I'm very well. How are you, Chris? Yes, I'm super. I'm really, really chuffed to be um, speaking to you. It's so kind you agreed to come on the show. For our friends at home, massive welcome. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Um, Annie Machon is a former MI5 intelligence officer. I've got that right, Annie. <laughs> Um, and I'm just absolutely delighted that uh, you've come on the show, Annie, because you're going to show us a side of life and an, and an insight that probably not many people get to hear. Mm. It's my pleasure. Um, I mean, most people say I've had a tumultuous life, which I have. But then I was reading about you and I thought, bloody hell, that's a completely different league. So it's a real pleasure to meet you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have had people on the podcast and they've been so fascinated in my story that <laughs> they've, they've just asked all the questions. Well, if they are fascinated, they should go to your website, chrisforall.com, and look at the books, buy the books, watch the videos and buy the merchandise. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's and you very... didn't ask me to say that, anyone who's watching. I just I was enthralled, so, yes. so to speak. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll chuck you the tenor later, Annie, all right? <laughs> So um, I was fascinated to see your father was a pilot. My father was a pilot, yes. Um, in his first professional iteration, he flew for BOAC way back in the day. I think it was the late 1960s, early 70s. So he traveled the world. And then he um, went and resettled back in our home island of Guernsey in the Channel Islands, hence my mm. funny French surname, and went into journalism. So he sort of followed his father into that line of work. And my father became the editor and of the newspaper and also an award-winning journalist. So I learned a lot about uh, the whole idea of, you know, speaking truth to power, about media ethics um, and everything from my father. Unfortunately, what I also learned from him, because he was a complete spy aficionado, he was a complete fan of John le Carre and Len Dayton novels and things, uh, was a lot about, you know, the so-called world of espionage. So he was the one who sort of dropped me into <laughs> um, MI5. So it's all his fault. Yes, it's a funny old world. Mm, mm. Especially with my mate who I've known for a while now, just dropped in the other day. I'm an MI5 agent. I was like, <laughs> 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 but um, when, when dad was a pilot, did you ever get a chance to go up in the cockpit? Mm, mm, mm. And I loved it. He used to fly VC 10s so he did all the long haul flights around the world. And um, I remember, I mean, this is, you know, pre hyper security days when I was a kid. I mean, we're talking 50 years ago um, when he could take me to Heathrow and he could show me I, around I, the I, airplanes I, and all that I, sort of thing. I would have said 25 years ago. <laughs> you flatterer. I'll give you the tenor bag. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I, I, I was a complete um, plane spotter as well. He said that, you know, I could recognise any plane shape in the sky and things like that. I was, you know, completely enthralled. And his father, who was also a journalist and editor, had actually flown Spitfires in the Second World War. So I've, I've always grown up with that sort of sense of um, military service and uh, a love of aviation and love of air shows, but also, you know, this in-depth absorption of what the media should be doing as well. So it was a very strange upbringing, but I loved it. Yes. Well, I'm a qualified pilot. And one of my <clears throat> most fascinating experiences was actually flying the Spitfire. Oh, wow, but, but, if I, but if I say I never left the ground, I don't know if you can <laughs> okay. figure of what it, it um, a very dear chap, um, kind man up there at Goodwood Racing Track, I think it is. 
um, mm, mm. has uh, uh, Richard has um, a Spitfire mock-up, you know, a sim simulator, but it's actually a Spitfire, you know, that it's all mm, built mm, from a mm. Spitfire. So you sit in it, you're in a Spitfire, you take off just look, literally as you would as a pilot. It's all got these vibrating things on it. So you feel, you feel the power, you, you know, you, you feel the, wow the, the, the turns and and you can pick anywhere you want so i said um harabia airfield which which is in the southwest it was one of the i think it was one of the few airfields in the war that the luftwaffe never discovered and you can still go out there now and see all the the remnants and the bunkers and all this kind of thing so so yeah i i i um flew over that and it was wonderful but can so just I know this is supposed to be an interview, but it's a chat, right? No, um, a, yeah. <laughs> is it something? It's sort of an experience you can sort of pay for because this would be a wonderful present for my father at some point. Oh, absolutely! Yes. Send me I'll, the link um, after this. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm. I'm gonna write my notes here to put a link for the Spitfire. Mm -mm. It was just absolutely brilliant, and my son got to fly it as well, which was just a dream come true for me. In fact, he wouldn't leave my side. So as I'm sort of turning to, you know, attack the Red Baron or whoever, it is, my, there's my boy there. Oh, all right, mate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> One second. I just got to get on the machine guns. <laughs> um, yes, wonderful. And the, the DC-10, that was a propeller? Uh, no, VC-10. It was VC the, fast, the fast jets before Concorde. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. God, the Concorde era. Showing yeah. our age, aren't we? Oh, unfortunately, yes. Can't escape. Yeah. Every night, guaranteed, if you lived in the southwest of England, come 10 o'clock. Yeah, we had hit. that in Guernsey. Yeah, the sonic yeah. boom. I the sonic that. boom. <laughs> yes. Wow. So how does one get into the intelligence services? Is that's, um, Do you have to meet on a park bench in Prague under the moonlight or something? or? <laughs> no, that's what you do afterwards. Um, um, in well, I was recruited in 1990 again, showing my age. And back in that day, it was still very much the old school type recruitment, um, where either you got a tap on the shoulder at an Oxbridge College, or you applied to something like the Foreign Office, which is what I did. And then they sort of identified you and sent you a very mysterious letter from the Ministry of Defence saying, would you like to try other jobs you might find more interesting, which is how I got in. And this is why it's my pa's fault, because when I opened that letter and it just said, maybe other jobs you find more interesting, if so, please ring this number. And I was in the family dining room at the time and my father was with me. And I said, in my usual ladylike manner, I hope your listeners don't mind swearing. And I went, oh, fuck, it's MI5. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's gut instinct. And... Um, that's when my pa just said, well, if it is MI5, please go and try and find out. Because as I said, he loved all the spy literature and everything. Um, and then 10 months later, I found myself working there. So that was the old school. Then in the 1990s, later, they began to open it up with sort of mysterious, anonymous um, articles in newspapers saying, if you're into current affairs and you know, stuff like politics, then there may be a job you'd like to apply for. So they went through recruitment consultants. Now it's much, much easier. They've opened up so much. So if you, if anyone's interested, and I would never, despite my experiences, I would never discourage anyone from joining, so long as that you know you have a strong ethical framework and can keep that on the inside. Um, now you can just go to their website, MI5, the MI5 website, and you do a preliminary test. And if you pass that, then the whole process that I went through will start. Um, one of the ways that the British intelligence agencies have been most successful. <clears throat> is this mythologizing of intelligence. I mean, even the CIA doesn't have it, despite, you know, Jason Bourne or whatever else has been going on, because we always had the James Bond franchise and we had John le Carre and all the adaptations. We had spooks in the noughties about MI5. So in a way, in terms of a, um, so putting this, a sort of um, use of soft power, the British intelligence agencies, despite being some of the most secretive in the world, have actually done incredibly well. Mm -hmm. how, how, Annie, how, what did you think when they came out and said that the intelligence services have never had a, um, 
an assassination policy in bond in bond obviously it's the famous license to kill isn't it and and uh, i think if we're in a certain country in the uh, middle east mm-hmm. i think they have no no issues with that that sort of thing but uh, when the british government said that they you know they've never assassinated i, I found that a bit of a stretch but yes um and even though I don't want to go into the geopolitics around Israel, um, if you're talking about their assassination policy of Iranian nuclear scientists, yes, they've been doing it. Yes, they've been caught out, but nobody's been brought to justice. And that's been over the last decade. Um, in terms of the UK, they have always said that, but um, boring illegal just for a moment. So the spies at the moment are um, controlled by two different acts of parliament, the Security Service Act 1989, which governs MI5 and makes them accountable to the Home Secretary. And the Secure, uh, in, sorry, Intelligence Services Act 1994, which governs um, SIS, the James Bond wing of British Intelligence, and also GCHQ, which is the um, listening post in the UK, um, which is governed by the Foreign Secretary, the political master, notionally. And um, particularly with the um, Intelligence Services Act, which governs MI6, I think it's Section 7, that basically means if they have the prior written permission of their political master, the foreign secretary, they can go and commit crimes abroad um, up to and including murder. That's not explicit, but it's implied. Um, And they will be legally exempt from prosecution. So that is the, a very civil service way of writing what is effectually a license to kill. Mm. Um, And this is going to take me into some of the MI5 stuff because uh, I mentioned I got recruited. I was there for six years. And it, during that time, I met my former partner and colleague, David Shaler, and we resigned after six years to go public, to blow the whistle about a whole series of incompetence and also crime that we, we witnessed on the inside. And we tried to raise our voices on the inside, as many of our peer group did, and were all told just to shut up and just follow orders. Um, so David and I <clears throat> took the decision to go public, knowing that it would wreck our professional lives and potentially land us in prison. And the key case that made us quit and made us do that was indeed an illegal assassination attempt against a foreign head of state who was Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. And this took place in 1996 and was planned and funded by MI6. Now, technically under the Intelligence Services Act, Section 7, they could have done it legally under British law, but in this case, they didn't even get the prior written permission of the foreign secretary. So that meant that this attack, which manifestly failed because Gaddafi survived to be assassinated another day in 2011, um, um, also killed innocent people in the security shootout around the uh, explosion under a wrong car. So we have MI6 funding um, a group that was at that point just coming onto the radar of MI5 as a threat, which was Al-Qaeda in an illegal assassination attempt against a foreign head of state without prior written permission, which went wrong and killed innocent people. Now, you think, how heinous can things get? So, yes, things have happened. Things will always happen. I mean, all intelligence agencies, of course, get up to nasties. The key point is to get the balancing act of oversight and accountability within the country um, from which they're operating. And that, I mean, I'm not trying to say they're all evil. That has always been a very key discussion, both for MI5, MI6 and GCHQ over decades, is trying to get that right balance of accountability and oversight. But there, if there are mistakes or if there are rogue elements that go ahead and do things without trying to get that accountability, then that's where we have a problem. Um, because therefore the intelligence agencies are operating outside the government and democratic control and can commit crimes with impunity. Yes, and and didn't David also come to prominence? Can we say when buildings started to fall out of the skyline, and he was quite vocal about the mm-hmm. uh, we can call it an FF. I think all my viewers know what I'm that to which I am referring. But um, I mean, there's a lot of nonsense going on in the world, isn't there? And there seems mm-hmm. to be there seems to be like two factions within every service whether it's military government secret service where those that are trying to get on and do an honest job and do their best for the for the people 
Mm, and there's mm. those that, um, let, let's just say, maybe they, they, they work for another master. Um, yes. Um, and if you're talking, let's just be blunt, if you're talking about 9-11, I presume you are. Mm. Yeah. Yes, we can chuck some numbers in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, yes, David was very outspoken about that. Um, I did take an interest in the very shallow waters around that because some very credible people came out of the intelligence agencies, particularly in America, saying that there had been uh, huge um, missteps and fuck-ups and, in fact, direct orders not to further investigate people who then went on to be the perpetrators of this crime. Um, most notably, Colleen Rowley, a former FBI agent, i.e. officer, um, who blew the whistle on a series of um, problems in the run-up, uh, which could have potentially stopped the attack within the FBI. And um, she and many of her colleagues were told to stop investigating by HQ. So she went public, um, somehow managed to avoid prosecution in the, U in the US, and was actually nominated, uh, elected as Time Person of the Year, Time Magazine Person of the Year 2002, for what she did. Um, and there have been many other credible people saying, we haven't got the full story. I mean, both from survivors of the attacks and from uh, architects and engineers and all sorts of that. So I don't know the rights or wrongs of it. I know that there's a whole messy swamp of conspiracy theory behind it. But I always think that, you know, within a democracy, we're all allowed to have our views and we should all be questioning. And what got me um, intrigued by the whole 9-11 issue was how quickly it enabled particularly the USA um, and the UK and its NATO allies to slide into the war on terror. You know, it was, whatever happened on the day, I don't know. But in terms of using it as a pretext, one, to invade Afghanistan, which had nothing to do with it, really, um, invade Iraq, which definitely had nothing to do with it, and then go on for another few Middle Eastern countries, and also strip away a lot of our traditional freedoms in our own homelands as well. Um, that's always been the angle that I've been particularly fascinated with. And the war on terror is something that I've done a lot of talking and commentating, made films about everything over the years. Yes, it, they should call it the war on how to create terror, <laughs> because they've not done a good job of it. Uh, yeah, well, you, know, you look at the mess across the Middle East and Central Asia. I mean, it, it's just mm. the humanitarian cost from the war on terror, um, mm. not least also the evisceration of basic human rights, you know, the, the concept of extraordinary rendition, which is like kidnapping of people, um, extrajudicial killings with drone strikes, Gitmo, of course, which is a, an ongoing weeping saw uh, in America's side. I mean, all these things have been absolutely terrible. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a whole rich, rich um, scene to mine there, absolutely, in how the West responded, um, what it has meant for their values, and also the, you know, the spiraling moral decline of some of our intelligence agencies. So, I mean, going back to the uh, Gaddafi assassination attempt into, in 90, sorry, 1996, and that was all super secret and had to be covered up. And the person who exposed it, the whistleblower, had to go to prison and be seen to be punished for exposing it. And it could never be investigated. And then you fast forward to 2011, which is still, God, 11 years ago. When Colonel Gaddafi, you know, when the NATO started bombing Libya and Colonel Gaddafi was assassinated then. And it was all done in the full glare of international media. And it was all justified as, yeah, we've toppled a dictator. Well, they tortured him and then mur murdered him as well. And so I think for me, that particular moral slide, that moral decline in Western values is of particular concern to me. Uh, I'm, you know, I've been advocated human rights and, and privacy and all sorts of other stuff for many years. And to see that acceptance by the Western media, that this is right, this is justified, rather than it has to be kept secret because nasties have always gone on, right? But now it's okay, we can do it and then publicize it. I find that horrifying, I really do. Yes, we could get quite deep into this. and uh... Yeah, I think we've gone, I don't like to get out of the shallow end of that pool, that particular yeah. pool. <laughs> yeah. I think um, there's two things going on. Well, two things going on there, though. There's what I call matrix politics, mm. which most people, if they want their pension and they want their 
promotions. It's quite good to analyze this and, 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 and orchestrate your daily life living in the matrix because it's quite safe and it's, it's one version of reality. And then there's two sets of groups outside the matrix. There's those of us that know the truth. Um, we love all people when we're enlightened individuals. And then there's the psychopaths or sociopaths who, who control the matrix. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place, place to be. Mm. Mm. I, I wouldn't want to go any further down that particular path today, though. So. No, no, let's not. Let's not. So um, how did your career progress? What, what, what stuff did you enjoy? What stuff were you, were, were you good at? Um, did you have any successes or, or did this sort of sudden halt or this, you know, expose kind of put a bit of a damper on things? <laughs> that's um, a very British way of describing yes it turns your life inside out and upside down if you go public <laughs> mm. um, it, it does it is a, a moment of no return it's, it's sort of crossing the Rubicon moment um, for any whistleblower coming out of any sector be it health or finance or whatever it is um, because it effectively ruins your professional reputation um, for the People coming out of the military or intelligence or central government or the foreign office and diplomacy, um, there's the added bonus that you might go to prison for exposing crimes, the crimes of others. So it was a very difficult decision to take, um, particularly because of the impact and cost it might have to our friends and our families, um, not just us. Um, but sometimes you get to a point where you just feel, well, if, we, if I don't do it, if we don't do it, who else is going to do it? And um, so afterwards, I mean, the whole case around the whistleblowing from when it happened through all the court cases and arrests and all the rest of it, it took seven years to resolve it. And come 2003, when it was finally resolved, it was a case of, um, well, what now? And those were very difficult years. And David and I, well, David particularly had suffered because he was the one who went to prison twice. So it, we ended up separating in 2006. And then it was a case of, well, what do I do now? How do I re rebuild a life after this? Mm. So that was um, pretty tricky. But I did learn a number of different lessons from the years of the whistleblowing, you know, when we were the focus of media attention, um, having to deal with a lot of lawyers, having to deal with a lot of invasion, and also dealing with a sense of personal privacy anywhere. So I, I sort of pulled back a bit and took a while to think about this. And I started thinking, well, OK, what's the intersection between the media and intelligence or the media and government? Because having seen my partner at the time traduced in court, well, not traduced in court, when... Um, he was inevitably convicted for breaching the Official Secrets Act in 1989 um, and went to prison for that. The judge at the time said that he accepted he hadn't done what he did for money and he hadn't put any agent lives in danger. And the headlines from the journalists sitting in that courtroom that day were exactly the opposite. So it's like, hang on, how is that flipped? How does the government, how do the intelligence agencies control the media? So I started digging into that and talking to some of my more trusted media friends. And... Um, ended up doing a lot of talks across Europe um, to investigative journalist conferences for a few years about that sort of power intersection. And what I found particularly interesting during those years was I'd be giving these talks and thinking, God, I might be sounding a bit conspiracy theorist, you know, perhaps I'm a bit too out there. And yet all of the journalists afterwards would come up to me and say, it's even worse in our country. <laughs> so I was like, whoa. Yeah. Um, the other key lesson I took away from those years was the concept of living with no privacy at all. So when I say that, because if I were the person behind an MI5 desk hunting me as um, David and I went on the run around Europe or lived in exile or were involved in a court case, I knew exactly how I would do it. and I was pretty good at it. So, you know, you couldn't trust that your electronic communications, of course, would not be bugged. Um, this is still vaguely the analogue era, by the way. Um, you couldn't trust that your home hadn't been bugged. 
and you couldn't trust cars or your workplace or even the people you were meeting would not be bugged. You couldn't go to the same restaurant um, too often because, I don't know, the whole thing just makes you so bloody paranoid um, living that way. Mm. So what happened after that was in 2007, I sort of fell headlong into a sort of technological um, hacktivist sort of route across Europe. So I met some people and started talking to, I mean, I'm not talking about hackers, the criminal hackers, I'm talking about hacktivists, people who are concerned about how the spies or corporations or criminals might be exploiting our information, our lives online. So I, I got to know a lot of them and learned so much from them and then ended up doing so many talks with them and for them at conferences that that has become a major strand in my life. And also, um, I mean, there's been a string of whistleblowers coming out of the US intelligence agencies, particularly most, and most notably over the last 15 years, people like um, Thomas Drake from the NSA, um, the US listening agency, um, Chelsea Manning, of course, the uh, private who came out of American, uh, the American military, and mm -hmm. um, was alleged, well, was found to be one of the sources for the WikiLeaks disclosures. Um, I had some contact with WikiLeaks as well, and I'm, I'm still appalled by the treatment of Julian Assange legally at the moment and by the press. For Julian, it's just got worse, Annie, hasn't it? He's now facing extradition from Belmarsh. Um, yep. Yeah. Look, I, I just want to say on this very strongly. Um, one, I know what a hellhole Belmarsh is, because when David Shaler was convicted in 2002 of a breach of the Official Secrets Act, he had to spend weeks there. Julian was placed there and has been there for over two years, even though he served his sentence for um, jumping bail, but he's awaiting this extradition um, under the Espionage Act in America, even though he's an Australian award-winning journalist and publisher living in the UK, which is absurd. So we have a situation um, where this poor man has been banged up in a hellhole for over two years. Um, and where he, even though he is a journalist, even though he is a publisher, is going to face espionage charges when he goes to the USA for publishing evidence of people of that country's war crimes, as well as crimes committed by corporations and other countries around the world. And it's such an appalling miscarriage of justice, but actually, uh, I, more importantly, going down into the future, it's an appalling precedent for any journalist around the planet because if this American hegemony can extend to picking out an Australian journalist out of the UK and then banging him up, then any other journalist who might expose US war crimes, for example, um, anywhere in the world is going to be equally vulnerable. And the fact that these, um, I'm good, I'm, I'm sorry, I was gonna say a really rude word there, the fact that these people don't see that threat and therefore they don't fight for the principle of press freedom is disgusting and it's craven. And it's actually, I would say, dishonourable. The press should be standing up for this man, and they haven't. Yes, it's awful. And also, I, I, I always stick up for our American brothers and sisters, many of whom I've met in, in many places around the world and who are the most wonderful people on earth, the most kind and generous. Obviously, not every single American, but, but, but mm -mm -mm. you know, let, let, let's, let's not pretend here. This is not America. This is controlling interests which is two completely separate things yeah, yeah um people say oh boris johnson i'm like dude stop thinking boris johnson a controls the uk or b cares about anybody in it he's he's so controlled but by by let's just call it glo glo a globalist agenda right which has nothing to do with our country nothing to do with america nothing to do with uh, you know, we can drag every country on the planet in Ukraine, what, you know, Libya, what, what, whatever. It's a globalist mm -hmm. agenda and they, they control the whole goddamn show and they do it really, really well. Um, well, it's been like saying, you know, all Russians are evil. Well, no, I mean, Putin has done an astonishingly bad thing invading Ukraine. I and mean, I don't want to go again into the geopolitics around this, but in terms of humanitarian suffering, and the, um, the way it's brought the world again to a nuclear brink for the first time in decades is appalling. But, you know, 
Russians are being stigmatized. There's so many, there's a diaspora of Russians all around the world, and they are being threatened and blamed for this. And it's not, it's because of the power structure within Russia. And it's the same with the UK, it's the same with the USA. Um, and yet, you know, it, um, as, as I mentioned, I know a lot of the US whistleblowers coming out of the NSA, coming out of uh, the FBI, coming out of the CIA. I mean, one of the most lovely people I know is um, a guy called Ray McGovern, who was a very senior CIA analyst for decades. He was honored for his service. He used to be the, the person who provided the intelligence brief to the president um, in, I think it was George Bush the first's um, presidency. And he gave it all up because of the war in Iraq and just said, I don't want this, I don't want the honors, I'm just going out and going to talk peace. And he's one of the, he is the founder of um, another wonderful organization I work for called the Sam Adams Associates, which is how I know all these lovely American whistleblowers. And not all, not all whistleblowers, but some of them are just truth, you know, they just put out, this is how the system works. And it's been an honor to meet people like that and to work with them. Mm. So. Americans aren't stupid. I, uh, I remember when I uh, got my pilot license in America, I was in the supermarket, and when people heard your English accent, they'd You can stop. buy a pilot li- uh, license in a supermarket. No. <laughs> <laughs> when I was getting my pilot license, I was in a supermarket. And, um, you know, they'd come up and say hi, and they would just say how grieved they felt that they had this blubbering idiot that that – I use the term president loosely. They don't control anything. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, not, 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 not to my mind, at least. Um, but they weren't stupid. They weren't stupid. They, you know, you, you mm. smoking guns are smoking guns. And if you can't, if something can't be, you know, signed, if the facts in the media can't be backed up scientifically, then that then it then it's propaganda or it's just a massive lie. So, mm. you know, I feel for them. But then I, I, you mentioned Putin. You know, this is a guy that's in this World Economic Forum. He's you know, he's all in this kind of Klaus Schwab thing that's trying to dominate every aspect of our life and and implant things into our children, implant stuff into in, into our brains, bring in digital currency. Um, it, it, it goes on and on. And this is all documented. I mean, the, the, the MOD recently brought out a paper on transhumanism, that the future soldier will be half machine. Uh, by machine, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, tech, tech, technology. This, this is... It's a Robocop type thing. Yeah, exactly. Because um, there's a great deal to be gained by circumventing, if that's the right word, human emotion, human Mm. limitations, such as tiredness, you know, human body structure. Okay. So possibly, you know, the use of advanced steroids and all this kind of stuff. Plus the fact that if you're on the battlefield, you might hesitate, you know, taking this, this target out, but if you can circumvent that part of the brain, then, 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 and this is, you know, it's all documented and also, you know, won't go too deep into this one, but Mr. Putin has been, uh, you know, very much part of a ludicrous past 24 months, fully supporting it for his people. So he, he's one of them. It's just that simple, you know. Uh, they're, they're, mm. uh, well, I think, you know, there's no way that people get to the top of the greasy pole if they're not a bit of a sociopath. I think it's the best way mm. of putting it. And as you mentioned, you know, in, in the US, just meeting people in the supermarket or whatever, um, most people just want normal things. They want um, a happy family. They want to be able to have a job that vaguely they can enjoy, put food on the table. Um, they can survive, have a community, um, whatever. You know, it's not too much to ask, I wouldn't think. But it's the control mechanisms behind um, each government that are the frightening bits. Anyway, let's not go down this. We need to yeah. make this sound like a sort of conspiracy talk, and we're not, because we're both professionals. And we know what we're talking about. Ed Snowden, then, come on. He he he's um, round about the same time, wasn't it? As Julius Assange, he he popped his head above the parapet and did a quite a, a memorable thing. He fled to Hong Kong to seek sort of at least temporary asylum, if not re- refuge from retribution. And he said basically. Oh, we're all being spied. <laughs> all our emails, our phones, don't don't believe the hype. It's it's I mean, it was 
the, the, in that famous interview he did, he even put a coat over his head while he logged into his laptop because he said that they're watching from they're watching from everywhere. Do you do you have any take on Ed Snowden, Annie? Uh, huge amounts, but just picking up on the um, you know the the thing over the head. Um, this was something that even Shayla and I knew about um, when we went on the run, and this is in the late 1990s. Uh, so I will tell everyone watching this: the only way to ensure that you can have a private, a really private conversation with another human being today, or even going back to the 1990s, is you get a slab of porcelain and you put one single sheet of paper on it, and you put a cover over what you're writing. So any camera that might be looking at you cannot see what you are writing. And you write it down and then you shove the other human being's head that needs to see this information underneath that cover. So again, there's nothing to be heard. There's nothing to be seen. And then as soon as they've ingested that information or whatever, you tear up the paper, you burn it and you scatter the ashes to the four winds or down the toilet. I mean, that's Mm. it. That is has been for the last 30 years, I tell you now, the only 100% way you can have a 100% secure um, contact with another human being. So what Edward Snowden was talking about, the fact he put his um, mobile phones in the fridge, the sort of Faraday's cage, because they all snoop and can be remotely switched on to record on us. Um, this has been going on for decades. This is not new. Mm. Um, David and I were aware of it in the 1990s. We had to use those techniques and we did. And what I thought was great about the Snowden case, therefore, moving on to that, was the fact that he um, made it very obvious to people that that was the sheer scale of the surveillance that we are all facing. So back in the 90s, for David Shaler and myself going on the run, um, we knew what they could do, and we took steps to avoid that. But it was much more analog and much more labor intensive to do that. What Snowden disclosed in 2013, and that's almost a decade ago, basically showed that actually at the flick of a switch on the internet, they could, do, they could do this to us all, and they were doing it to us all. And that is what we need, one, to be aware of, and two, to be aware of what it means for us, because a lack of privacy is very um, debilitating, personally, if you can't speak freely or read stuff freely or watch stuff freely or you're concerned about what the internet might be tracking you on or what your mobile phone might be tracking you on or how easily the mobile phone could be hacked. Um, in order to you know, break into your bank account or your health records or whatever. But um, just in terms of the threat to democracy too, because if more of us become aware of this, we become more inhibited in how we do communicate. And this was called the Snowden effect after 2013. Then it becomes a less free society where we can get together, talk freely, activate a campaign, have relationships, even have sex online. And suddenly we stop doing that because we are frightened about our privacy. So these are all huge issues, which one has got me into working with the um, World Ethical Data Forum, World Ethical Data Foundation, which I will talk about in a minute if we have time. Mm. Um, And two has brought me to write a new book, which is coming out this autumn called Approaching Danger. Oh, wow. Yeah, give that a shout. How's that been writing that? Mm, uh, It was an interesting process to go through, um, but the first draft is finished and it should be coming out in the first week of October. But it's just trying to pull together all the, because of my weird history, you know, spies and whistleblowing and the media and the tech and the hacktivism and the whistleblowers and all the rest of it, trying to pull together what I perceive as the threats, trying to pull together what I perceive as um, the solutions to give people hope. And there are solutions, you know, we're not all doomed, not yet but we do need to take action fairly soon. Mm. What do you think the solution is, Annie? Oh, um, on multiple levels. One is um, we as citizens um, become aware of what the range of threats are so we can mitigate against against them, be it for ourselves, be it for our work, be it for our children um, being predated on. Um, And also, I think this whole process has been accelerated because of the COVID pandemic, you know, forcing us all to live our lives much more online um, or our work making us have Zoom calls rather than meeting in person. So that makes us exponentially much more vulnerable to um, state data harvesting, which is what they do, corporate data farming, which is what they do, and criminal hacking and attacking, which, of course, happens, too. So it's the three key 
things. So as individuals, there are steps to take. As corporations, there are definite obvious steps to take. And as governments, there should be policy to be made. And that's what I'm trying to set out. But for anyone who's watching this who is concerned about their personal privacy, and depending on the risk assessment, the threat model they would perceive for themselves, Mm. because, you know, it depends what you're doing, who you're working with, all that sort of stuff. You know, you need to be more or less paranoid. So, um, for example, if I were um, a female Afghan journalist at the moment, currently now reimposed inside a burqa, but still wanting to have contact with the outside world, I would definitely be using a suite of different privacy enabling tools. Uh, starting with open source software, uh, moving on to things like um, Tor, which is uh, the onion router, which is basically obscured web searching, Mm. which includes things like Tails or Cubes programs, um, which are sort of separate operational systems that can be stored in a little disk and then plugged into a computer and it gives you a different operating system. You can unplug it and you're back to Microsoft or whatever, which can be snooped on. Um, up to things like uh, VPNs, virtual privacy networks, um, and then on to things like uh, PGP encryption, pretty good privacy if you want that. Although a human idiot put out some passwords a few months ago, so it might not be 100% secure. So if you are really, really, really paranoid or if the threat against you is really, really, really hard technologically, there there are a suite of tools that you can use, but it makes the use of the internet a bit clunky and most people like the convenience, right? So for me, um, not being involved in certain things at the moment means that I don't worry too much. But if I, if I am approached by whistleblowers or journalists who want to talk about sensitive stuff, I, I take measures. One has mm-hmm. to. Uh, oh, God, this, this is a notorious um, uh, hacking hack attack. It came out of an Israeli company called the NSO. It was exposed a few months ago. And um, so I'm going to rewind a bit. Oh, no. Yeah. Pegasus. Are we running out of time? No, no, no. We're fine. Absolutely fine. Um, So Pegasus was this thing that um, came out of an Israeli company, which um, when it was first reported, apparently had um, targeted 50,000 people of interest around the world, mainly politicians, diplomats, um, civil servants, that sort of thing. And what was fascinating about this was it was a zero click attack. So in the past, if... um, antagonistic organizations wanted to target your gadgets, they would have to send you something that you would click on. And therefore your phone, particularly, they're all wide open and vulnerable, but all your computer would be infested. This zero click attack meant that they had backdoor weapons that could get into commonly used apps like WhatsApp, for example. Mm. So you didn't have to do anything. You just had to have the app stuck on your phone and your phone could be taken over. And in fact, I think it was only last week that it was, shown that someone's phone in um, 10 Downing Street, uh, the UK um, government HQ, um, had been attacked in this way. So the zero click attack is interesting. This is why I wanted to roll it back. Um, So um, intelligence agencies build up caches of cyber weapons um, and backdoor vulnerabilities into corporations, which they do not disclose to those corporations because they might want to use them in the future. And this was something that was exposed in the Vault 7 disclosures from WikiLeaks in 2017, I think it was. And then also another cache, similar cache of cyber weapons held by the NSA in America um, fell into the hands of a bunch of cyber criminals called the Shadow Brokers around the same time. And they then put it up for auction around the planet. And, And nobody talks about this. Nobody really knows about it. But that means we're talking about military grade cyber weapons out there on the market or out there being exploited by cyber criminals. And this is where a lot of things like um, the WannaCry attack against the NHS a few years ago came from, I think, Um, and other ransomware attacks, which are now seen to be the biggest thing that can threaten cyber companies in the UK, according to MI5. So even spy agencies like the CIA or the NSA cannot protect their cyber weapons cache they fall into the wrong hands. They fall into the hands of criminals who then mutate them and exploit them. And therefore, we get attacks like WannaCry or like ransomware or potentially Pegasus. Who knows where they picked that one up from? Mm. So this is why I always see there's an intersection between the, the corporations and their vulnerabilities, the spies and their security vulnerabilities, and then falling into criminal hands makes us all vulnerable, both individually, 
societally and you know internationally as well mm. there's this thing and he isn't there well <laughs> say isn't there you don't know what i'm going to say but um was it Ho de la Garonne was the children's home on Jersey or, or, or some such? Something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. The... Excuse my pronunciation, folks. but And uh, I'm going to say allegedly because it just is handy using that word. But allegedly uh, some hideous abuse of young people took place there for many years, culminating in I think they were excavating the site looking for bones and this sort of mm. stuff. Um. And I heard through a certain source that it was allowed to go on for years because our politicians were popping over there to, um, I'm just going to say, harm children. And it was all caught on camera. Um, I, I, I don't know. I did, it wasn't a case I followed particularly. No, but the, the the intent being that once you've got a politician who's doing stuff that he really shouldn't be doing, then you've got them for life and they're going to, I mean, I think I, without going into finer detail, I think we saw this in the Iraq war um, when the whole country's going, no, and you've got one individual going, yes, but <laughs> George is telling me you're, um, um, I just wondered if you had any insight, any it, it, I mean, uh, it, it's quite in-depth stuff, really. But, um, it, you know, once you're compromised, you're compromised. And if you're in a position of power, that's really handy to, to the powers that be that want to manipulate you and get you to yeah. vote this way in this and vote this way in that and put this to your people. It's, it's, uh, it, it, yep. it's shocking. I totally agree. I mean, uh, and I can talk about this because it's out there. Um, one of the ways that um, the spy agencies can recruit agents in the field to get information they want, um, it's an acronym, it's MICE, Money, Ideology, Compromise, Ego. So money is obvious, ideology is obvious, ego is obvious, but the compromise is usually exactly what you're talking about, mm. where someone is caught out and therefore they have to do the bidding, they're blackmailed effectively, to do what um, the blackmailers want them to do, be it you know, spooks or corporations or whatever. Um, and we've seen this time and time and time again to be a very effective way. One of the things I mentioned, um, going back to my MI5 days, when I, the first work I did was looking at um, subversion, i.e. red under the bed, that sort of thing. And there was a, there was a general election in 1992. And back in those days, you had to, we had to, look at the files held on anyone who was standing as an MP, potentially. And a lot of old historic files came out of the registry um, on Labour MPs, particularly, um, who then went on in 1997 to win the Tony Blair landslide victory. So the fact that all these people who were in Tony Blair's government, up to and including Blair himself, knew they had files held on them by MI5, but didn't know what MI5 knew, um, I think was a, a grave democratic concern. I mean, they were supposed to be the political masters, and yet they didn't want to cross paths or take on the spooks because they didn't know what the spooks knew about them. You know, I'm sure they all have these little skeletons rattling around you know, in the back of their minds. Can I just um, recommend um, mm. to you and your listeners as well, particularly, there's a wonderful organisation called Veterans for Peace UK. Have you come across them? Yes, I, I have. Um, it's like everything. You, 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 you're you going to hear this angle and you're going to hear this angle, the other angle being controlled opposition, of, of obviously. I, I, I'm not suggesting that, but I have people that have been on the podcast that speak quite disparagingly about them. On the other hand, I've had individuals on the podcast that are a member of uh, Veterans for Peace that have very, very lovely people. Hello, hello, Spike, if you get to see this. <laughs> but well, why do you mention it, Annie? No, I was just wondering if you'd um, interviewed Ben Griffin. He's been leading it for years. I think he stood down now. But he was the um, SAS soldier who refused to serve in Iraq in 2003 um, because he said the war was illegal, which I would tend to agree with. Um, but he'd served all over the world, done all sorts of stuff, so they couldn't really dismiss him as a coward. 
Um, so he's gone on to to build up this sort of network of people with credibility to say war is not the answer. Why not? I think it's a great thing to do. What, interview him or go to war? <laughs> <laughs> interview him yeah. no he's a lovely um, guy anyway I, but, I've yeah. been I've been trying to interview Ben for about four years now oh um, do you want me to, okay do you want me to have a word I mean, he's lovely yes though. yes we should do we should do um I've spoken to like I say veterans of peace have been on my podcast um um what can I say I've been talking to the office on several occasions and I I can't speak I, I mean Ben's story is incredible. What an absolute, what a true special forces legend to stand up and tell the truth. Uh, what next then? You mentioned Sam Adams Associates. Could you tell us more about that? Because it's not something I've, I, I vaguely come across it, Annie. But Yeah. Um, again, it, it's, this is a weird life post whistleblowing is you, you, do things because you believe in them and then you meet new people and then you stumble into new things and it's great. It's part of the joy of life, I think. And therefore, when I went over to, I think it was New York in 2010 or something, and I met a number of people from the Sam Adams Associates, including Ray McGovern and Colleen Rowley, um, who I mentioned, the FBI whistleblower. And um, they had set up an organisation to give a, an award every year to someone who displayed integrity in intelligence. So uh, there, were, there was a very rich <laughs> rich field, should we say, in the early 10s, sort of 2011, 12, 13, with people like Chelsea Manning and um, Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, all those sort of people. And so a lot of the awards they wanted to hold in Europe, and being the person they knew in Europe, I ended up organising them. So I got to know them and they'd come over and it was just just such an amazing impact to meet these people who had this strong drive to try and affect change within the US system, which, of course, at that point was seen as really toxic. Mm. Um, and, um, yeah, I just feel honoured to be part of them. I became one of the organisers and they gave me the award in 2020, which I was really, really taken aback with because... It wasn't for the old whistleblowing stuff. It was actually for the advocacy I'd given to whistleblowers um, and on behalf of whistleblowers, you know, throughout the media and public speeches and organising events over the last decade. And that was, I was so touched by that. But I would recommend everyone have a look at Sam Adams Associates and some of the people involved, most of the people involved, a hugely immense, richly back, rich backstory, um, whether they blew the whistle or whether they tried to change the system from within what their experiences were. Um, it's a lovely organisation. Yes. And ha um, was, that, was there anything in particular you were um, awarded this honour for, Annie, or was it your general sort of um, honesty? Uh, for my advocacy, for all the whistleblowers coming out and trying to advance their cause and, you know, defend them in media interviews and defend them in talks and debates and um, give them platforms. I think that was the key thing. And um, yeah, I, yeah, that, that was it. Most yeah. people don't understand the human cost that whistleblowing takes. I mean, as I said earlier in this interview, not just intelligence or government, maybe with NHS whistleblowers or whatever, it ruins someone's life. But for people um, coming out of the environments I'm talking about, they face prison too. Oh, that reminds me. Hang on. Um, here we go. A friend of mine in Berlin, lovely woman called Tatiana Batzikelli, um, pulled together a sort of anthology of different whistleblower experiences, um, which was published this year. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. What's her name, Kata? Uh, Tatiana Batzikelli. I'll send you a link afterwards. But yes. So she, she got a bunch of us um, to give our perspectives and she asked me to give this sort of overview of the principles at stake and the, the costs at stake and everything. And then she got various talks from uh, articles from various whistleblowers um, and a couple of academic articles. It's a really good book. So it's called Whistleblowing for Change, Exposing Systems of Power and Injustice. She might be a good interviewee as well. She's lovely. Good friend. Yes. 
And it's been great having you on the show. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I hope this doesn't get you into any trouble. Um, feel you, as I say to all my guests, you're welcome back on at any, any time. I wish you the best with your book. Do you know when it's coming out? It should be the beginning of October this year. So very fast production. Okay. Um, and it's called Approaching Danger. Approaching Danger. We'll put a, or Luke, our editor, will put a, a mention of that below, below the bit video. But yes, thank you very much. So everybody at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourself. Please make sure you're turning off that mainstream media so you're not locked into this to this thought matrix and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Chris. You're more than welcome.